Um, it's fallen on me to um, introduce our keynote speaker. Um, when we were hatching this idea for this symposium, uh, we were sitting around the table in, in the archive seminar room and thinking about we needed someone who had a broad enough overview of the subject to give us a kind of contextualisation of what this word, this, this title that we'd come up with, staging the real, might mean, what it might mean historically, politically, across a range of, of uh, performance practices and design practices. And I said, I know the man, I know the person. And I'm absolutely delighted that Professor Arnold Aronson of Columbia University in New York has agreed to come over and do a keynote for us. I suspect most of you in this room know who he is, so I'm not going to go too much through his long um, and distinguished career. Perhaps just to say that his books, I think, have been seminal in shaping our ideas about sonography and theatre design, from um, the history and theory of environmental design sonography, um, which has now just come out in its second edition. Um, was the first edition in the 70s, Arnold? Uh, 81. 81. Just 81, yeah. Um, and it's now been revised, and I have to say is as, is as um, vibrant and relevant now um, in, its, in its second edition, and I do recommend it, to things like um, Looking into the Abyss, which again shaped a lot of people's thinking around sonography and, and design. Um, he's also just finished and, and completed the extraordinary um, Routledge Companion to Sonography, uh, which I do suggest people look at because it is an extraordinary collection of articles um, on the subject, probably the biggest collection ever to be um, produced. So I won't say much more, apart from that um, it's, I'm absolutely delighted, Arnold, that you've come. Perhaps I should say that we also co-edit the journal Theatre and Performance Design together, which is a great privilege. And um, just to say welcome and thank you for coming across to see us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jane, for that introduction. And I want to thank my colleagues uh, and new colleagues at UAL for the honor of being here uh, and your generosity in bringing me here. There we go. Uh, ponder these quotes. I'm not going to talk about them directly, but the first one in particular from Farquhar is one of my favorite quotes in all of theater history. I'm still not sure what it means. Um, when I was asked to give this talk, uh, inevitably, as our speakers have already suggested, the first thing that popped into my mind is, what is the real? Uh, and that was followed by a second thought about what, is, what does it mean to stage the real? And if you stage the real, does that negate the, the reality? Uh, what I'm going to do uh, is, uh, is to sort of muse upon, uh, ponder uh, the idea of the real. And because this is uh, done in conjunction uh, with Jocelyn Herbert's archive, I'm going to move via Bertolt Brecht, uh, to talk a little bit at the end about uh, Jocelyn Herbert's work in this context, but there are others here who are greater experts than I. So in asking what is the real, I'm not overly concerned with metaphysical or <clears throat> Cartesian examinations of reality, although I'll touch on that. I am interested more in what we might define as an epistemological approach. How do we perceive the real? How do our perceptual encounters with the world translate not only into our understanding of the world, but how we represent the world? Uh, and important for sonography, how we recognize representations of the world. Numerous philosophers have dealt with the notion of the real, uh, but in modern times, the concept seems to be most closely associated with Jacques Lacan who posited the triad of the imaginary, symbolic, and real. Ironically, uh, the imaginary is the least relevant for today's discussion. Um, without going down the rabbit hole of Lacanian theory, and I am hardly an expert, so if there are any experts here, please forgive me. Um, Lacan explicates the symbolic as something constituted by oppositions, such as presence and absence. 
This implies that in the realm of the symbolic, something may be missing. The symbolic is a set of differentiated signifiers, but the real for Lacan is undifferentiated. It is, to use his words, without fissure. Uh, it is a totality, or to put it in Kantian terms, the thing in itself. The symbolic for Lacan introduces, quote, a cut in the real, in the process of signification. In the symbolic, he says, it is the world of words that creates the world of things. But the real, for Lacan, is something that exists outside of language and is therefore not describable nor accessible through language. If we accept this, then the process of staging the real clearly presents a challenge. The very act of staging implies description, which imply, requires a language of some sort. But Lacan's description of the symbolic as a cut in the real seems to echo the more prosaic description of naturalism as a slice of life. That phrase was coined by the French playwright Jean Julien uh, in his 1892 uh, uh, essay, uh, the, Le Théâtre Vivant. What is less remembered is that the entire sentence was, a play is a slice of life put on the stage with art. Julien himself objected to the fact that the second part of his sentence got left off when people discussed it. The subject matter might be drawn from life, uh, but through selectivity and framing, it is transformed and then may be read by the audience as the real. My working hypothesis for the, this talk is that to stage the real <clears throat> is to put a perception <clears throat> excuse me, of the actual world on the stage, which is to say uh, an image of the world filtered through a particular consciousness. This image is then framed thus setting it off from the surrounding world, so that it may be apprehended, consumed, and decoded by others, by spectators. The notion of framing is crucial, because in order for that decoding to occur, the spectators must first recognize that they are seeing a world of art and not actuality, just to say, how do we know we are watching theater? I would suggest that it's at its most basic, Art is created simply by placing a frame around something, thus separating it from the external world and in the process eliminating any of its functional, va any functional value it may have. This was demonstrated most delightfully, of course, by Marcel Duchamp, who by attaching a signature uh, to a urinal and inverting the urinal, turned it into a work of art, as most of his ready-mades were. Uh, you can look at this for a while. Uh, so what does the real look like? Actually, not so long. Uh, what are we looking at here? For many of us, certainly for me, when I first encountered it, uh, it appears to be some sort of an abstract painting or design of some sort. It is, in fact, a painting by uh, an Australian Aboriginal artist and it depicts an actual scene. It depicts women dreaming about digging up and roasting root crops. At the center, we see a circular fire with fire sticks radiating out from it. In each of the corner, those sort of horseshoe-shaped curves with dots on them represent the women. And the long sticks coming out from those curves are their digging sticks. Uh, these white patches represent the onion-like onion root that they are digging up. Uh, presumably, the artist did not actually see the women or the terrain in this way. I'm sure he saw women in human form uh, and not as painted dots. But a set of conventions has established this as the visual language by which to represent reality. It is perhaps uh, the way in which this particular society organizes and conveys information about the experiential world, and it embodies the conventions by which the viewers read reality. After all, representation is an act of translation and the subsequent decoding of that translation. 
Now, I want to show you a painting that probably many of you are familiar with, a 19th century French painting that is, for all intents and purposes, a depiction of an identical scene, which is more real. And while pursuing this theme, I was reminded the other day, while visiting the Turner paintings at the Tate, which I love to do, uh, that Turner also depicted a similar scene. Uh, where does this one fall on the continuum of the real? In suggesting that the aboriginal painter saw the world differently than we in the West, I'm not making any sort of a value judgment. The West has also gone through different ways of perceiving and depicting the so-called real world. Uh, as this comparison of two slides will show, uh, of an identical scene, one by a medieval artist and one by Renaissance artist. So both scenes are the same, both are depicted differently. Um, much philosophical debate throughout history has focused on the difference between appearance and reality. Uh, there is something, the so-called skeptical argument, uh, that assumes there is such a difference, and that if objects in the external, uh, and asks if objects in the external world uh, possess immutable characteristics which can be perceived by everyone alike, or, in fact, is nothing ever directly uh, present to the mind and only knowable through perceptual appearances. If Millet and Tiapaltiari uh, are seeing essentially similar subjects, why do they depict them so radically differently? Each of them are, depict are depicting something real. Similarly, uh, the artists of the Mid Middle Ages and Renaissance, we know that the physical and temporal world did not suddenly change between 1410 and 1564. Medieval Europe did not defy Newtonian laws of time and space, yet the representation of that world sometimes depicted multiple locales uh, and points in time simultaneously. The depiction of space usually lacked the perspectival structure that we today generally understand as an indication of distance, which also Im implies time. While the physical world did not change over the course of a century or two, the conventions and vocabulary of depicting the world in European art, the means of organizing and conveying information, the way of seeing changed. The task for the sonographer then is to determine how to create a perception and appearance of the world that is recognizable to the contemporary society and will be accepted as such. An amusing example of perception is found in a presumably apocryphal anecdote from late 4th century BCE Greece uh, of Parmenon Sow, which is found in Plutarch's Moralia. The actor Parmenon was known for his skill at mimicry particularly for his imitation of the squealing of a pig. Things had changed since the fifth century in Oedipus. Uh, at a competition, uh, Parmenon's enemies brought a live pig into the theater to prove that Parmenon's imitation was faulty. Parmenon did his pig squeal, and then the actual pig was made to squeal, to which the audience apparently shouted, good, but not as good as Parmenon's. <laughs> A more modern example occurred in the early days of phonograph records. Thomas Edison staged a demonstration in which an opera singer and a recording of her voice on the early discs, this was beyond the, uh, uh, the, the tubes already, uh, uh, the two of them were hidden behind a curtain. The singer sang an aria, contrapuntally with the recorded version, and supposedly the audience could not tell the difference though today we certainly could. In the 1970s, the Memorex Corporation advertised the high quality of their recording tape with the slogan, is it real or is it Memorex? Clearly, in these cases, a combination of cultural determinants combined with a very willing suspension of disbelief play a significant role in the way in which we perceive reality. In fact, we seem almost more willing to accept something that has been transformed through artistic means as a truer form of reality. 
uh, that an idealized representation somehow possesses greater truth than the mundane actuality of the object itself. Not all pigs, after all, sound like our idealized concept of a pig. <clears throat> Moving from orality to visuality, the notion of the real has been associated with photography since its earliest days. We all realize that even before the advent of Photoshop, in fact, almost from the first daguerreotypes, photographs could be manipulated and altered. And of course, photos, like all art, create meaning through the way in which they are framed by the artist. Where are we as viewers and situated in relation to the image, for instance? What is within the frame and what has been excluded? But because of the fundamental technology of photography, of analog photography, we have until recently tended to think of photographs as unmediated depictions of the real. They appear to capture and freeze a moment of time and place. We have been told that the camera does not lie. Interestingly, uh, that phrase uh, first appeared in the theater. Uh, and the phrase was, the apparatus can't lie. In Dion Boussico's 1859 melodrama, The Octoroon, in which a camera caught the villain in the midst of a murder and was then the resultant image was then used as evidence to convict him. But even 20 years earlier, within months of the introduction of the daguerreotype, Edgar Allan Poe declared that the daguerreotype is infinitely more accurate in its representation than any painting by human hands. And he goes on to say that it is, quote, an absolute truth, a perfect identity of aspect with the thing represented. With that in mind, look at this. This brings us into the world of perceptual appearances. Photographs have a particular set of signifiers which we read as photograph as opposed to painting, and which therefore <clears throat> we read as real. But we've always known that paintings can lie, if you want to call it that. Among other things, paintings can look like photographs. This is a painting. It's an example from a movement that emerged in the 1970s called photorealism. On the one hand, this movement celebrated painterly technique but was also intended to challenge perceptual appearances, as well as the authority of the photograph. Photorealism is a kind of reverse engineering, as it were, uh, employing a set of signifiers that cause us to read, paint, and canvas as a photo, and thus an unmediated document of reality. This manipulation tricks our brains into initially ignoring the signifying elements that would alert us to the fact that this is a painting. So which captures the real? Estes' photorealistic painting of Nedix, which by the way is a fast food chain from the first half of the 20th century, an actual photo of the restaurant, a painting of a diner, not Nedix, obviously more famous painting, uh, but it is clearly a painting. So among these things, which one is the real? Here is another image. Don't worry, this is a photograph. Uh, although I bet some of you began to wonder. Um, the signifiers are not lying. And in fact, because every element of, it, of the content appears to be natural, natural, we read this with our traditional understanding of a photograph. Up there. Um, uh, as we uh, read it as a traditional understanding of the photograph, is simply capturing a real moment in time and space, which on one level it does. Everything in this image is real real women, real mountains, real grass, real barbed wire. There's no technical manipulation. But this photo gets us to the other part of the title staging. As natural as this looks, this is not a slice of life. The women in the photo were carefully staged, including, I believe, the cost their costumes. I know that Dana Hoey's photographs often includes, she picks out costumes for the performers. It creates a tableau that carries a particular socio-political implication about power, hierarchies, relationships, and so on. So the photo itself is real, but one aspect of the content, its narrative, is not. Real versus the real. 
Uh, interestingly, critics uh, in describing Hoy's work and other similar work uh, within the photographic field have begun to use the word sonography. Staging implies artifice, manipulation, contrivance, deception. So if we can go from the sublime to the truly ridiculous, uh, in the world of real estate, photos of interiors uh, are frequently staged in order to seduce potential buyers. There are professionals, in essence, set de decorators, or perhaps we can call them real estate sonographers, who will reorganize the contents of a home or bring in new furniture, artwork, rugs, and so forth. That is, props and set pieces. More recently, the trend is to create virtual images of tastefully furnished rooms that are, in fact, empty. So in looking at these examples, what you are seeing is the walls and ceiling of each of these rooms is real. They are actual rooms. Everything in them has been digitally created. Something to think about. In order for us to respond to the world on stage as real, uh, it must be seen as a possible world, by which, a world, by which I mean uh, a world that, through analogy, reference, or imitation, reflects our actual world. I just used the phrase actual world, uh, but I think when we are discussing the world around us in our everyday conversations, in addition to actual world, we might say real world, tangible world, external world, experiential world, and so on. I'm sure you can think of more all have in common an assumption that there is an absolute world that exists inde independent of individual perception, the philosophical issue I alluded to earlier. The notion of a possible world is generally attributed to the 17th, 18th century philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, Leibniz uh, who in attempting to explain the presence of evil in a God-created world, postulated that we live in the best of all possible worlds, a concept famously parodied by Voltaire and Candide. But the notion of a possible world, best or not, lies at the heart of the real. There is a branch of philosophy known as concretism. His primary proponent is David Lewis. For Lewis, everything that we might think of as the real world, what concretists would call the concrete physical universe, is connected in space and time. Uh, I'm going to put up a quote by him so we can, you can read along with me. He said that the world we live in is a very inclusive thing. Every stick, every stone you have ever seen is part of it. So are you and I. So are the planet Earth, the solar system, the entire Milky Way, the remote galaxies that we see through telescopes. There is nothing so far away from us as not to be part of our world. Anything at any distance is to be included. Likewise, the uh, world is inclusive in time. No long gone Romans, no long gone pterodactyls, no long gone primordial clouds of plasma are too far in the past, nor are the dead dark stars too far in the future to be part of this same world. Nothing is so alien and kind as not to be part of our world, provided only that it does exist at some distance and direction from here, or at some time before, or after, or simultaneous with now. He goes on to say that other possible worlds, other universes, may exist and be like ours, but one cannot have an influence on the other. In other words, what happens in one world stays in one world. It does not impact what happens in another. More importantly, one world cannot occupy the same time and space as another. Extrapolating from this, I would say that a world on stage must in some way be analogous to our own world, uh, but can have no causal relationship to it. We must recognize it as a possible world, a parallel world, but not our world. One of the distinguishing characteristics of theater is that it occurs within a shared space and at the same moment in which we experience it. Since a stage appears to exist within our own time and space, we must have some way of distinguishing the two worlds. And this is where the frame comes in again. If everything within the world of our daily experience, the concrete world, encompasses anything and everything found in this world, then everything on the stage is real. 
The performers are real. If there are walls, they may be constructed of painted canvas on, on wooden frames, as Simon alluded to. Uh, a glass of whiskey may, in fact, be apple juice. But the component materials are real. However, the act of framing at least temporarily removes everything within the frame from the concrete world. The enframed object, uh, image, or performance is perhaps analogous to an embassy inside a foreign country. By international agreement, that embassy is not part of the country in which it geographically exists, and the people within it are not subject to the same rules as those outside. Fortunately, I wrote this before what happened in Turkey. Uh, thus, everything on the stage is simulta simultaneously real and not real. Around the turn of the 20th century, it became commonplace to import elements of the concrete world onto the framed world of the stage. André Antoine at the Théâtre Libre in the early 1890s took furniture from his mother's flat and transported it to the theater to use in his productions. I have yet to read how his mother responded to this. Um, I unfortunately don't have a photo of one of his early productions, uh, but here is one of, this says, The Wild Duck at the Théâtre Antoine of 1906. But you can see we're dealing here with real furniture, real lamps, real tablecloths, and so on. But do notice the somewhat wrinkled ground cloth that represents the floor. Um, David Belasco, an American director, writer, producer, uh, purchased the entire interior of a well-known New York restaurant and reassembled it on the stage uh, for a production called The Governor's Lady, uh, 1912. Yes, and I'm sorry, the poor quality of this photo. It's, I think, the only one that exists of this. Um, and the restaurant even supplied actual food every night for the performers to consume. So does the importation uh, of objects from the external world, the concrete world, onto the stage, make the resulting environment, and hence the production, more real? Does it make it the real? Uh, there was Jerzy Veltruski of the Prague Structuralists, who in 1940 observed that everything on the stage is a sign. The frame transforms the real object into a signifier. But ironically, as a result, because of the framing and the transformation of signifiers, uh, something that is real in one context may not be in another. So if an actual tangible piece of furniture or bric-a-brac is ripped from its home and translated into a stage prop, is it still real? As a three-dimensional object, of course it remains real. But a real object inserted artist into an artistically created sign system, the stage set, risks disrupting that very sign system. Meyerhold recounted a story about Chekhov, who was becoming increasingly frustrated by Stanislavski's naturalistic techniques, uh, touches uh, during the rehearsals of The Seagull. The stage is art, blurted out Chekhov. <clears throat> and he continued, there's a genre painting by Kramskoy in which the faces are portrayed superbly. What would happen if you cut the nose out of one of the paintings and substituted a real one? The nose would be realistic, but the picture would be ruined. So to stage the real doesn't necessarily mean putting something real on the stage, especially if that thing is, back to Kant, the thing in itself. In illusionistic theater, we seldom think of the duality of the objects on stage something existing in our quotidian world while simultaneously being part of a fictional construct. Having brought up the seagull, let me stay with the Moscow Art Theater for a moment since they are so associated with naturalism, which at the time was thought of as real. It's been 120 years since its founding, but we're still feeling its impact. Uh, the seagull established the theater's reputation and despite Chekhov's objections, also established, established a benchmark for naturalism. Spectators claimed to have forgotten they were watching a play. One critic wrote, quote, at times it seemed that what spoke from the stage was life itself. The audience was largely responding to the psychological realism of the actors, of the acting, but look at the photos. 
Uh, this, in some way, takes us back to Parmenon Sow and Edison's phonograph. Uh, the radical change from past practice was so great that the audience ignored all the elements that practically screamed artifice and threatened the illusion at every turn, and instead focused on those signifiers that reinforced a sense of the real. Notice the prompter's box looming in front of the audience. Uh, the two, obviously two-dimensional trees and the very improbable lighting of what is supposed to be an exterior scene. Um, this, um, this was notable, though, this is the first act of, of Seagull. There was a bench down center, and actors did sit with their backs to the audience. That was a realistic touch. Um, uh, in the Moscow Art Theater production a couple of years later of The Three Sisters, I've always been fascinated by the ceiling, which is wrinkled, um, although they got the four floor flat this time. Also, just the fact that we have ceilings on box sets <clears throat> doesn't happen much anymore. Um, clearly, uh, what was perceived as real in 1898 or 1901 is no, lo no longer reads as real in 2018. We encounter this phenomenon every time we watch a movie from past decades. Uh, and we wonder how the hairstyles, the clothing, the scenery could have been taken for real in 1930 or 40 or whenever. And 10 years from now, the movies of today will look equally dated. Uh, this is a good point, perhaps, at which, for the first time, to bring in Jocelyn Herbert. Uh, she did a production of The Seagull, uh, but it's obviously very different, although it has many of the signifying elements. Uh, but her set is symmetrical, it's geometrical. Uh, the dominant element becomes the chairs, at least in this photograph. Uh, but it also, because of its height and the way there is no ceiling, and that it fades up into a surrounding space, takes it out of the realm of the real, in Moscow art theater terms, but somehow, by its refusal to submit to a slavish imitation of the external world, I think strikes us even today as somehow more real. Um, I also want to show a picture from the 1904 production of The Cherry Orchard. Uh, in this case, notice that first of all, unlike a real room, box sets in theaters have strange angles in their walls, but more importantly, they line up everybody parallel to the curtain line so that the audience can, of course, see them very nicely. Uh, this kind of staging tends to remind me of an old joke of what did Jesus say at the Last Supper? Why don't we all come and sit on this side of the table? <laughs> What is fascinating is that, the, with, a, with the exception of a missing Christ figure, the arrangement, they're, they're actually looking in the same direction. Uh, if we want our Christ figure, we have, of course, this staged photograph of Chekhov reading uh, to the, the seagull to the Moscow Art Theater. Notice Meyerhold at the end, uh, sort of the Judas figure, I guess. Um, OK, I should get back to our actual uh, subject. Um, so this notion of how do you present actors on a stage so that they are functioning in a three-dimensional space. Antoine actually tried it. Um, but directors have been grappling with this for well over a century now. Um, and I want to show you one example of how to deal with it, although not with a literary play. Uh, this is a piece called Habit. Uh, by David Levine, who is a director and theater creator. And what you are looking at, uh, we're now looking down, the audience did not have that perspective, is a, uh, a single story house with one bedroom, but everything in it is functional. There's running water, the toilet works, the shower works, the stove works, there's a refrigerator. Three actors essentially live in this space. They perform a 90-minute play that was specifically written for this space, a kind of a melodramatic soap opera sort of thing uh, that includes a few things like that somebody gets shot and there's a few other things that they must do and must say. 
Uh, the audience, as you see, looks through the windows at what's going on. The piece, as I said, lasts for 90 minutes, and it is repeated again and again, as in a loop, for eight hours a day, uh, forcing the actors to become something other than actors. They, Levine refers to them as laborers, putting in an eight-hour day. Uh, it changes their relationship to their characters, uh, and from moment to moment, from loop to loop, it does change another kind of reality. So Jocelyn Herbert, along with John Burry, is credited with transforming British theater design in the post-war era, as I'm sure you all know, uh, moving away from the painterly and the decorative to a more minimalist style in many cases, uh, that at the time could be read in some ways as more real. Uh, John Burry, I, to my mind, tended a little bit more towards the bleak, Herbert more to the poetic. But a primary catalyst for everyone uh, at the time was the visit of the Berliner Ensemble to London in 1956. Um, even Pamela Howard, who was with us, has talked about that visit, I know. Um, Brecht did declared that we needed a theater for a scientific age. Part of his approach was the creation of an aesthetic, of aesthetic distance, the alienation effect, so that we could observe and analyze. He and his designer, Caspar Neher, understood that illusion enveloped the spectators emotionally, making them lost in a world and thus incapable of rational thought that would lead them to action. He understood that by stepping back, you could actually achieve a greater truth. One technique was to emphasize the very theatricality of the stage while simultaneously lavishing care um, sorry, uh, on certain scenographic elements, uh, such as props and costumes. In one of the most iconic images of 20th century theater from Mother Courage, uh, we see an empty stage, no attempt to create an illusionistic landscape, and yet the wagon is lovingly detailed, as is Mother Courage's costume, as we see in a little more detail in this image. Um, and as I said, this had a major impact on British theater, and in particular, uh, Jocelyn Herbert. Uh, she commented on the use of their real objects and real materials in costume. Writing about Mother Courage, she noted that the props, quote, had a quality of reality and truth and usedness, she made up a word there, about them which wasn't painted. <clears throat> it was actually worked on, she said. It was a lesson in a kind of perfection of truth, but it wasn't naturalism. These are very impressive glasses. Uh, <clears throat> writing about design <clears throat> for the epic theater, Brecht talked about his friend, <clears throat> Caspar Neyer, uh, with the famous quote, with what care he selects a chair, with what thought he places it. There is no building of his, no yard or workshop or garden that does not bear the fingerprints of the people who built it or lived there. He makes visible the manual skills and knowledge of the builders and the ways of the living inhabitants. In his designs, our friend always starts with the people themselves and what is happening. Uh, to or through them. He provides no decor, frames, or backgrounds, but constructs the space for people to experience something in. The real for Brecht and Neher comes from selected detail, not from illusion. Uh, one of the techniques that Herbert used in her work was to isolate her sets within a larger theatrical environment, creating a frame within a frame, as it were. Uh, look at her design for Chicken Soup with Barley. Here is uh, a, a rendering uh, as she was working on it. Uh, she has created uh, a room with the necessary furnishings, uh, but it is actually rather spare. But look at what she has done. We see uh, the flat set within an apartment block. Uh, so we are as if a fourth wall were removed, and we have the privilege of peering into their house but a certain kind of external reality surrounds it. Uh, I was kind of struck as I was in the archive coming across this, where we have a literal frame in which she's working on the external, uh, but of course the space in which this flat will exist. Um, in the final realized uh, design, 
in, I'm afraid, a not great photograph, <clears throat> the claustrophobia of the space <clears throat> is dissipated. It opens into space above. It loses its solidity and sets the flat within the larger neighborhood, the larger world, by projecting images of other buildings behind it that we can see in this upper area. <clears throat> oh, so once again, there is reality below of a certain kind selected and theatricality above and a surround of theatricality so that we are looking at some aspect of the real within the theatrical. Um, I was also, oh, so I'll come back to something else. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to compare her design and that production, Chicken Soup with Barley, to a 1935 production in the US, in New York, uh, called Awake and Sing by the American playwright Clifford Odets, whose work might be described as sentimental socialist realism. <clears throat> it was produced by the left wing group theater. Uh, the play's themes are somewhat similar uh, to Chicken Soup with Barley a few decades later. Uh, but as you see, whereas Herbert placed Chicken Soup it with Barley in a theatrical environment, the group theater's production was a kind of socialist realism, uh, more like those of the Moscow Art Theater in a totally enclosed environment. An interesting side note, this set was designed by Boris Aronson, no relation to me, uh, a Russian emigre who had uh, trained in Russian constructivism. But when he came to the US, he did some constructivist sets for the Yiddish theater, but mainstream theater was totally uninterested in constructivism or anything else vaguely uh, avant-garde. Um, it was not until the 1960s when the director, Hal Prince, chose him to design Cabaret, Fiddler on the Roof, Company, and others that Aronson's true genius could flourish. When I was looking through some of Herbert's work at the archive, I was struck by some of her research sketches. Just as Nayer uh, sought out details that would give his designs truthful reson resonance, apparently so did Herbert. Look at her telephone poles and especially the street lamp. The buildings she of course sketched out fairly quickly. Uh, they're real enough, but we don't need to see every brick. We can just barely make out some kind of a sign painted on the building. But the details on these and to some extent the chimneys are very carefully etched in there. And I think it is because when she was going to translate this into an actual design, it is exactly these touches that give it a sense of truth, even though the audience may not even be consciously aware of it. Um, while the set of chicken soup with barley was isolated within a visual framework that suggested the apartment block and neighborhood in roots, um, she essentially isolated the house within a theatrical surround uh, with projections. So this is, of course, obviously the rendering, uh, but the trees that you're seeing behind were intended to be as projections. Uh, here is the set in one of the acts and looks pretty much like this, although the chimney now has been rotated to another side. Um, here it is again, now the chimney rotated back. Uh, but it is clearly within a theatrical surround. It is isolated. Uh, I refer to this kind of design as island design, in which, um, in which a set is isolated as like an island within the greater sea of the stage. Um, again, there are precedents for this uh, in the US in the 1920s. Oops, uh, sorry, got one more here, Ball, which does essentially the same thing. Um, in the 1920s, uh, the Theater Guild produced a few plays with designs by Lee Simonson, which did fundamentally the same thing, a, real, uh, a kind of realism set within the stage, separated from the concrete world. We cannot look at the isolated setting without registering the expanse around it. One more hallmark of at least some of Herbert's work is the skeletal structure, uh, which we uh, see here, and I'm talking about Jerusalem. Uh, 
in which a space will ultimately be depicted not with any solidity, which he's already been starting to eliminate in some of the other designs, but now a frame that suggests a house and gives us all that we need. It's not the details of the wall that are important. It is a framework that tells us we are within a particular space and the few necessary props and scenic pieces to fill that out. Um, she is not alone in doing this kind of design. Joe Melziner in the famous production of Death of a Salesman also created a skeletal house. What you're seeing here is the image of that house seen through a scrim. Um, so in pointing out some of these precedents for her work, I'm not at all suggesting that she copied their styles or was influenced by them. Uh, she may not even have been aware of them. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this is something that is functioning in the theater. She came to this uh, analogous technique, but from a different standpoint, I think, one that depended on essentializing and simplification. Illusionism is easy, easily shattered. Just as we are distracted by the wrinkled cloth that makes up the ceiling and the three sisters, uh, but when it is theatricalized, the realistic, details, uh, the realistic details ground us in the real, while the theatricality situates, situates us in the world, of course, of the theater. I would suggest that the theater of every age stages the real. Greek tragedy with its formal poetry, choral odes, masks, and music is not in any way illusionistic, Yet Oedipus is so real, he can be psychoanalyzed. Medea is so real that we have real terror and fear for the children. Hamlet also can be put on the psychoanalyst's couch. Uh, and we also believe in the music hall tramps who are stuck in the barren landscape of Beckett's waiting for Godot. All of these are staging the real, but they are not real in that naturalistic sense. The real does not depend on a scenography of simulacra. The real demands a scenography that releases the truth beneath the surface. Thank you.